Welcome to Deconstructing, where I take apart an iconic horror movie to find out what makes it tick. For our first installment, I decided to go big, so today we're going to examine John Carpenter's 1982 classic, The Thing. It's an intimidating task, considering there's nothing about this film that hasn't been reviewed, studied, critiqued, and otherwise dissected by legions of fans. So we're going to keep our focus on three aspects of Carpenter's masterpiece. Those are origin, comparing the film to the original short story as well as the 1951 adaptation, legacy, from its controversial release and box office flop to its restored reputation and cult following, and mystery, arising from the plot's many unanswered questions. Again, this isn't a review, a retrospective, or a film school thesis, and you've already seen plenty of those anyhow. I'm just going wherever my crazy thought processes lead me, and noting whatever bits of trivia catch my attention along the way. So, suit up and grab your flamethrower, because we're deconstructing the thing. We finally got one. We found a flying saucer. John Carpenter fans already know about his fondness for the films of Howard Hawks. Assault on Precinct 13 is the director's homage to Hawks' classic western Rio Bravo, and of course Hawks' 1951 production The Thing from Another World makes a cameo on Haddonfield's Dr. Dementia Horror Marathon in the original Halloween. But you may be surprised to know Carpenter didn't deliberately set out to remake The Thing when he was offered his first feature deal at Universal. In fact, the producers initially offered the project to Toby Hooper based on his reputation from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but that fell through. Once Carpenter landed the gig, he was not interested in remaking Hawks' film as much as returning to its source material, the 1938 novella Who Goes There by John W. Campbell. The film sticks closely enough to Campbell's story that reading it calls up familiar images and themes from the movie. The most important element of the story, which the 1951 version ignores, is the thing's ability to mimic the appearance, personality, and memories of any organism it consumes. Screenwriter Bill Lancaster drew directly from Campbell's story for his draft, but rearranged elements of the plot and location. For example, the dog which escapes the Norwegian camp in the opening scene is a key plot point in the novella, but unlike the movie, the dog doesn't come from another camp. A piece of the thing imitates one of the American sled dogs after being accidentally thawed out, but it's destroyed before it can finish. <laughs> Meanwhile, the Thing manages to kill and imitate one of the humans without being noticed, which brings us back to Carpenter's version. The novella includes the characters McCready, Blair, Dr. Copper, Bennings, Clark, Norris, and Gary, and their roles are basically the same, although their job descriptions are different, and the Thing takes over even more team members than in the film. In both versions, Blair realizes the only way to save humanity is to sacrifice the lives of everyone on the base, although his methods in the film are a lot less organized. In the story, McCready is a scientist, not a pilot, but he's still the one who theorizes the thing is a colony creature and that every cell of the organism is capable of replicating itself. Every little piece is an individual animal with a built-in desire to protect its own life. It'll try and survive crawl away from a hot needle say. There's one key difference though. In the novella, each piece of the thing is connected to the whole by telepathy. In the film, that connection is mostly implied until the crew witnesses Norris's runaway cranium. You gotta be fucking kidding. Damn straight, Palmer. Like in the film, Blair is eventually taken over too, and the crew stops him just before he completes an anti-gravity vehicle which the thing's been building to reach the outside world. Another major difference is the film takes place in the first goddamn week of winter. But in the novella, it's the end of winter, which makes the situation more critical as there's more likelihood of a rescue team reaching them. In reality, winter temperatures at the South Pole can reach minus 100 degrees Celsius, which is cold enough to kill you in a matter of minutes. The sun never rises and violent storms make it hard to walk, much less fly a helicopter. One last significant difference is the ending. In the novella, the human survivors successfully destroy the thing, but in the film, we don't really know if they succeed. I'll get into that later, too. The Thing was released on June 25, 1982. Audiences at the time wanted extraterrestrials to be friendly and helpful, and they were appalled by the Thing's avalanche of graphic special effects. I guess I shouldn't blame them, but seriously, what a bunch of wusses. 
Sure, there was a flashy Hollywood premiere hosted by Elvira, as well as a contest by Fangoria inviting readers to depict what they imagined the thing would look like. But audiences stayed away in droves, and the film made only a small profit. Even some late modifications to the ad campaign failed to scare up tickets. It was also trashed by mainstream critics who called it junk, wretched, nihilistic, unsatisfying, and just plain boring. Christian Nyby, who directed the 1951 version, called it nothing more than a commercial for J&B Scotch. Still, Rob Bottin's groundbreaking creature effects earned the film some praise. And from there, word of mouth began to trigger people's morbid curiosity. Then something magical happened. The home video boom of the early 80s was reaching its all-time peak, and The Thing became one of the most sought-after rentals after Universal released it on tape in 1983. The Thing developed such a huge cult following that critics began to reevaluate it, praising the ensemble cast, Dean Cundey's cinematography, Morricone's score, and of course Botine's effects, which still hold up today. No computer graphics here, and yes, I'm looking at you, 2011 prequel. Now for the best part. The Thing's many unanswered questions have led to countless fan theories. Here are some of my personal favorites. One of the film's most pivotal scenes is the discovery that all the crew's refrigerated blood samples have been destroyed, thus sabotaging Copper's serum test. But which one of them did the deed? Gary claims to have the only key to the blood storage, and Copper is the only one who usually borrows it. But when McCready conducts the hot needle test, we learn both Copper and Gary were human all along. I'd rather not spend the rest of this winter tied to this fucking couch! We also learned Bennings, Norris, Palmer, and Blair have all been assimilated, so it's safe to assume it was one of them. But which one? It's established that Windows borrowed Gary's keys to open the storage shed, where the infected Norwegian corpse is kept. Bennings is left alone, and Windows returns to discover he's in the process of being imitated. When Windows runs out to warn the others, we hear the keys hit the floor. But the Bennings thing doesn't escape the same way. It breaks the window. Also, it's not done transforming, and it's destroyed before it can get very far. So let's look at Norris and Palmer. Assuming they were both assimilated before the thing gets to Blair, this shadow on the wall must have been one of them. But the shadow itself provides no clues because that's not the shadow of actors Charles Hallahan who plays Norris or David Clennon who plays Palmer. It's a member of the film crew. Of these two, Palmer seems the more likely suspect. He's pushed to the background during and after the blood discovery and he's missing during Blair's freakout. But he refuses to accompany Windows on a recon, demanding instead to go with Childs who is much more willing to eliminate any suspects. Plus, during the hot needle test, Palmer seems awfully calm considering the others are terrified they might be imitations themselves. See, in the novella, the thing takes over the victim's personality and memories, so if you've been assimilated, would you even know it? Palmer's oh well expression here suggests he knows the jig is up. It's also established Palmer is usually high as a kite, so is the thing high too? It didn't seem aware of Norris's heart condition, which ultimately forces it to expose itself. Is it impeded by Palmer's burned out brain cells? That's a hilarious idea, so I'm gonna say yes. Considering the suspenseful buildup to Fuchs's death by fire, his fate is pretty anticlimactic. Who's that? Until the hot needle scene, he was the only one working on an alternative test, so it's safe to assume the thing chose to kill him rather than risk copying him and exposing itself. But the real reason for his abrupt demise was a budgetary decision. The original script contained a jump scare reveal of Fuchs's body. Nalz's fate is also left ambiguous for the same reason. During the finale, we see him walk into the shadows, and that's it. But the script and storyboards show him being attacked by the Blair thing, or a part of it, when it ambushes him from the rafters. There are many scripted scenes that had to be cut, as well as several that were shot but omitted from the final print. If you're curious about how these scenes might have played out, they're all in the novelization by Alan Dean Foster, which was based on an earlier draft. McCready discovers the thing cannot replicate clothing or any non-living material, as evidenced by Nalls' discovery of thermal underwear in the kitchen trash and the reveal of McCready's torn clothing in his shack. This was likely planted by the Blair Thing to cast suspicion on McCready since the Blair Thing is able to move freely about the camp at this point. But if Fuchs's theory is correct about a single cell of the Thing being capable of assimilating a human, why didn't it jump onto the first person who picked up the discarded underwear? It must have had some alien cells still stuck to it. Can you kill the Thing by washing your hands? I'll just chalk this one up to suspension of disbelief, since the torn clothes are just a plot device to cast doubt on McCready, whose name tag is purposely the only one not removed. 
That leads us to the biggest mystery of all. Childs and McCready are the only survivors after the explosion, but it's never made clear which or either of the men has been assimilated. So who's the most likely suspect? Childs can be seen wandering off into the storm and claims he got lost chasing Blair. But that seems like an odd decision considering the dangers of going outside in such hostile conditions. And Childs had been left alone for a long time while the others were rigging the explosives. Since the Blair thing isn't around when they discover its underground workshop, it could have escaped the camp to attack Childs and then lay low until it was sure the humans were dead. It would have been the perfect backup plan for this very eventuality. But Carpenter wanted to leave the ending ambiguous in order to underscore the terrifying possibility of the thing escaping. The producers hated this idea, thinking audiences at the time wanted to see the humans win, and it turns out they were right, but Carpenter wisely stuck to his guns. Some fans claim the absence of Childs' breath in this scene is a clue that he's not human. But I'm not buying that, for two reasons. First, director of photography Dean Cundy has already explained why you can only see Kurt Russell's breath. He's backlit by a flickering orange light meant to simulate and enhance the flames behind him, while Keith David emerges from the shadows to face the flames, so it's less likely his breath will even register on camera. But that's not the only evidence poking holes in this theory. You notice Childs' ear stud? It's established the thing can imitate non-living matter, and that presumably includes metal. Sure, the thing may have had time to assimilate Childs, find new clothes, and reinsert the earring, but since it knows the crew is about to blow the camp to bits, that doesn't seem like a big priority no matter how fast the thing is. Also, if we assume the script sticks closely to Campbell's novella, then we can assume the thing is capable of copying every aspect of a victim's personality and memory. If replication is as perfect as the story suggests, there's a distinct possibility you could be assimilated and not realize it. That means either survivor could be an imitation, and there's even the possibility both of them are. I'm sure many of you have your own theories about these and other mysteries of the thing, and we'd love to hear about them, so be sure to mention them in the comments. Also, let us know what you think of this little thought experiment, and if you liked it, tell us what horror movies you want to see deconstructed next. In the meantime, be sure to subscribe and keep watching the skies.